Hey, my squirrel listeners. Oh my gosh, I checked, which is what I should always do to see how long the chapter is before I read it. You know, chapter one was very long. I'm not quite sure I'll go away. Uh, getting all these messages popping up. I don't know how to turn them off on this thing. Sorry about that. Hang, hang tight. Hang tight. Okay. But this one, y'all, has like 50 pages. So I will be doing a part one and two. However, I did remember to bring my Oh, I love my little squirrel cut. It's so cute. Anyway, let's start. Chapter 2, it says, Extracts from various letters from the same to the same. <laughs> let's have a little wet your whistle before we start. Always in the morning dental glue issues by the way go wash this mop shortly i hope uh september 26 do you know where i go to read your letters across the road into the grove there's a little dale there where the sun dapples the ferns a brook meanders through it there's a twisted mossy tree trunk on on which I sit in the most delightful row of young sister birches. After this, when I have a dream of a certain kind, a golden, green, crimson vein dream, a very dream of dreams, I shall please my fancy with the belief that it came from my secret dale of birches and was born of some mystic union between the slenderest, airiest of the sisters and the crooning brook. How poetic she is. I love to sit there and listen to the silence of the grove. Have you ever noticed how many different silences there are, Gilbert? The silence of the woods, of the shore, of the meadows, of the night, of the summer afternoon. All different because all the undertones that thread them are different. I'm sure if I were totally blind and insensitive to heat and cold, I could easily tell just where I was by the quality of the silence about me. School has been keeping for two weeks now, and I've got things pretty well organized. But Mrs. Braddock was right. The Pringles are my problem. And as yet, I don't see exactly how I'm going to solve it in spite of my lucky clovers. As Mrs. Braddock says, they are as smooth as cream and as slippery. The Pringles are a kind of clan who keeps tabs on each other and fight a good bit among themselves, but stand shoulder to shoulder in regard to any outsider. I have come to the conclusion that there are just two kinds of people in Summerside, those who are Pringles and those who aren't. <laughs> Haves and have-nots. My room is full of Pringles and a good many students who bear another name have Pringle blood in them. Well, now it sounds like she's a teacher. Before, didn't it say principal? Maybe I read that wrong. The ringleader of them seems to be Jen Pringle, a green-eyed bantling who looks as Becky Sharp must have looked at 14. I believe she is deliberately organizing a subtle campaign of insubordination and disrespect with which I am going to find it hard to cope. She has a knack of making irresistibly comic faces, and when I hear a smothered ripple of laughter running over the room behind my back, I know perfectly well what has caused it, but so far I haven't been able to catch her, catch her out in it. She has brains, too, the little wretch. Can write compositions that are fourth cousins to literature and is quite brilliant in mathematics. Woe is me. <laughs> There's a certain sparkle in everything she does or says, and she has a sense of humorous situations, which would be a bond of kinship between us if she hadn't started out by hating me. 
As it is, I fear it will be a very, it will be a long time before Jen and I can laugh together over anything. Myra Pringle, Jen's cousin, is the beauty of the school and apparently stupid. She does perpetuate some amusing howlers, as for instance when she said today in history class that the Indians thought Champlain and his men were gods or something inhuman. Socially, the Pringles are what Rebecca Dew calls the elite of Summerside. Already, I've been invited to two Pringle homes for supper because it's the proper thing to invite a new teacher, so she is, to supper. And the Pringles are not going to omit the required gestures. Last night, I was at James Pringles, the father of the aforesaid Jen. He looks like a college professor, but in reality, stupid and ignorant. He talked a great deal about discipline, tapping the tablecloth with a finger, the nail of which was not impeccably, and occasionally doing gr dreadful things to grammar. The Summerside High had always required a firm hand, an experienced teacher, male preferred. He was afraid I was a little too young, a fault which time will cure all too soon, he said sorrowfully. I didn't say anything because if I had said anything, I might have said too much. So I was as smooth and creamy as any Pringle of them all could have been and contented myself with looking limpidly at him and saying inside of myself, you cantankerous prejudiced old creature. <laughs> Jen must have got her brains from her mother whom I found myself liking. Jen, in her parents' present, was a model of decorum, but though her words were polite, her tone was insolent. Every time she said Miss Shirley, she contrived to make it sound like an insult, and every time she looked at my hair, I felt that I was just plain that it was just plain carroty red. No Pringle, I am certain, would ever admit it was Al Auburn. I like the Morton Pringles much better, though Morton Pringle never really listens to anything you say. He says something to you, and then while you're replying, he's busy thinking out his next remark. Mrs. Stephen Pringle, the widow Pringle, Summerside abounds in widows, wrote me a letter yesterday. A nice, polite, poisonous letter. Millie has too much homework. Millie is a delicate child and must not be overworked. Mr. Bell never gave her homework. She is a sensitive child that must be understood. Mr. Bell understood her so well. Mrs. Stephen is sure I will, too, if I try. I do not doubt Mrs. Stevens thinks that I am that I made Adam Pringle's nose bleed in class today by reason of which he had to go home. And I woke up last night and couldn't go to sleep again because I remembered an I, the letter I, I hadn't dotted in a question I wrote on the board. I'm certain Jen Pringle would notice it and Whisper will go around the clan about it. Rebecca Dew says that all the Pringles will invite me to supper except the old ladies at Maplehurst and then ignore me forever afterwards as they are the elite. This must mean elite instead. I guess that's what elite is. Uh, they may mean that socially I may be banned in Summerside. Well, we'll see. The battle is on, but it is not yet either won or lost. Still, I feel rather unhappy over it all. You can't reason with prejudice. I'm still just as I used to be in my childhood. I can't bear to have people not liking me. It isn't pleasant to think that the families of half my pupils hate me. And for no fault of my own, it's the injustice that stings me. There go more italics, because you had injustice in italics. But a few italics really do relieve your feelings. Apart from the Pringles, I like my pupils very much. There are some clever, ambitious, hard-working ones who are really interested in getting an education. Lewis Allen is paying for his board by doing housework at his boarding house and isn't a bit ashamed of it. 
and Sophie Sinclair rides bareback on her father's old gray mare six miles in and six miles out every day. There's pluck for you. If I can help a girl like that, am I to mind the Pringles? The trouble is, if I can't win the Pringles, I won't have much chance of helping anybody. But I love Wendy Poplars. It isn't a boarding house. It's a home. And they like me. Even Dusty Miller likes me, though he sometimes disapproves of me and shows it. By deliber deliberately sitting with his back turned towards me, occasionally cocking a golden eye over his shoulder at me to see how I'm taking it. I don't pet him much when Rebecca Dew is around because it really does irritate her. By day, he is a homely, comfortable, meditative animal, but he is decidedly a weird creature at night. Rebecca says it's because he is never allowed to stay out after dark. She hates to stand in the backyard and call him. She says the neighbors will all be laughing at her. She calls in such fierce, stentorian tones that she really can be heard all over the town on a still night shouting for puss, puss, puss. The widows would have a conniption if Dusty Miller, and that's the name of a plant that I really like, wasn't in when they went to bed. Nobody knows what I've gone through on account of that cat. Nobody, Rebecca has assured me. The widows are going to wear well. Every day I like them better. Aunt Kate doesn't believe in reading novels, but informs me that she does not propose to censor my reading matter. Aunt Chatty loves novels. She has a hidey hole where she keeps them. She smuggles them in from the town library, together with a pack of cards for solitaire and anything else she doesn't want Aunt Kate to see. It is in a chair seat, which nobody but Aunt Chatty knows is more than a chair seat. She has shared the secret with me because I strongly suspect she wants me to aid and abet her in the aforesaid smuggling. There shouldn't really be any need for hidey holes at Wendy Poplar's, for I never saw a house with so many mysterious cupboards. Though, to be sure, Rebecca Drew won't let them be mysterious. She's always cleaning them out ferociously. A house can't keep itself clean, she says sorrowfully when either of the widows protests. I am sure she would make short work of a novel or pack of cards if she found them. They are both a horror to her orthodox soul. Rebecca Drew says cards are the devil's books and novels even worse. The only things Rebecca ever reads apart from her Bible are the society columns of the Montreal Guardian. She loves to pour over the house and furniture and doings of millionaires. Just fancy soaking in a golden bathtub, Miss Shirley, she said wistfully. But she's really an old duck. She has produced from somewhere a comfortable old wing chair of faded brocade that just fits my kinks and says, This is your chair. We'll keep it for you. And she won't let Dusty Miller sleep on it, lest I get hairs on my school skirt and give the Pringles something to talk about. The whole three are very much interested in my circlet of pearls. So the two widows and Rebecca do. Uh, and what it signifies, Aunt Kate showed me her engagement ring. She can't wear it because it has grown too small, set with turquoise. But poor Aunt Chatty owned to me with tears in her eyes that she had never had an engagement ring. Her husband thought it unnecessary unnecessary expenditure. She was in my room at the time giving her face a bath in buttermilk. She does it every night to preserve her complexion and has sworn me to secrecy because she doesn't want Aunt Kate to know it. Imagine washing your face in buttermilk. She would think it ridiculous vanity in a woman of my age and I'm sure Rebecca do thinks that no Christian woman should try to be beautiful. 
I used to slip down to the kitchen to do it after Kate had gone to sleep, but I was always afraid of Rebecca Dew coming down. She has ears like a cat's even when she's asleep. If I could just slip in here every night and do it. Oh, thank you, my dear. So Anne is doing that, I guess. But it says giving her face. She does it every night. I, I'm lost. Okay, I have found out a little about our neighbors at the Evergreens. Mrs. Campbell, who was a Pringle, is 80. I haven't seen her, but from what I can gather, she's a very grim old lady. She has a maid, Martha Monkman, almost as ancient, ancient and grim as herself, who is generally referred to as Mrs. Campbell's woman. And she has her great-granddaughter, little Elizabeth Grayson, living with her. Oh, Elizabeth, on whom I have never laid eyes in spite of my two-week sojourn, is eight years old and goes to public school by the back way, a shortcut through the backyard, so I never encounter her coming or going. Her mother, who is dead, was a granddaughter of Mrs. Campbell, who brought her up also, her parents being dead. She married a certain Pierce Grayson, a Yankee, as Mrs. Rachel Lynn would say. She died when Elizabeth was born, and as Pierce Grayson had to leave America at once to take charge of a branch of his firm's business in Paris, the baby was sent home to old Mrs. Campbell. The story goes that he couldn't bear the sight of her because she had cost her mother's life and has never taken any notice of her. This, of course, may be sheer gossip because neither Miss Campbell nor the woman ever opens her lips about him. Rebecca Dew says they are far too strict with little Elizabeth, and she hasn't much of a time of it with them. She isn't like other children, far too old for eight years. The things that she says sometimes, Rebecca, she says to me one day, suppose just as you were getting, just as you were ready to get into bed, you felt your ankle nipped. No wonder she's afraid to go to bed in the dark, and they make her do it. Mrs. Campbell says there are to be no cowards in her house. They watch her like two cats watching a mouse and boss her within an inch of her life. If she makes a speck of noise, they nearly pass out. It's hush, hush, all the time. I tell you, that child is being hush, hush to death. And what is to be done about it? What, indeed? I feel that I'd like to see her. She seems to me a bit pathetic. Aunt Kate says she is well looked after from a physical point of view. What Aunt Kate really said was they feed and dress her well. But a child can't live by bread alone. I can never forget my, what my own life was before I came to Green Gables. I'm going home next Friday evening to spend two beautiful days in Avonlea. The only drawback will be that everybody I see will ask me how I like teaching in Summerside. But think of Green Gables now, Gilbert. The lake of shining waters with a blue mist on it. The maples across the brook beginning to turn scarlet. The ferns golden brown and the haunted wood and the sunset shadows in Lover's Lane, darling spot. I find it in my heart to wish I were there now with, with, guess who? Do you know, Gilbert, there are times when I strongly suspect that I love you. <laughs> Thank goodness she admits it. Nineteen minutes. Wendy Poplar, Spooks Lane, Seaside, October 10th. Honored and respected sir. This is how a love letter of Aunt Chatty's grandmother began. Isn't it delicious? What a thrill of superiority it must have given the grandfather. Wouldn't you really prefer it to Gilbert, darling, etc.? 
but on the whole, I think I'm glad you're not the grandfather or a grandfather. It's wonderful to think we're young and have our whole lives before us together, isn't it? Several pages omitted. Anne's pen being evidently neither sharp, stub, nor rusty. I'm sitting on the window seat in the tower looking out over the trees, waving against an amber sky and beyond them to the harbor. Last night I had such a lovely walk with myself. I really had to go somewhere, for it was just a trifle dismal at Wind Windy Poplars. Aunt Chatty was crying in the sitting room because her feelings had been hurt. And Aunt Kate was crying in her bedroom because it was the anniversary of Captain Am Amasa's death. And Rebecca Dew was crying in the kitchen for no reason I could discover. <laughs> Everybody's crying. I'd never seen Rebecca Dew cry before. But when I tried tactfully to find out what was wrong, she pettishly wanted to know if a body couldn't enjoy a cry when she felt like it. So I folded my tent and stole away, leaving her to her enjoyment. I went out and down the harbor road. There was such a nice, frosty, october -y smell in the air, blent with a delightful odor of newly plowed fields. I walked on and on until the twilight had deepened into a moonlit autumn night. I was alone, but not lonely. I held a series of imaginary conversations with imaginary comrades and thought out so many epigrams that I was agreeably surprised at myself. I couldn't help enjoying myself in spite of my Pringle worries. The spirit moves me to utter a few yowls regarding the Pringles. I hate to admit it, but things are not going any too well in Summerside High. There is no doubt that a mm, C-A-B-A-L has been organized against me. Cabal. Let's look that up. Oh, come on. Oh. I hate it when it does this. Come on. Let me look that word up. Let's see. Cabal, maybe. A secret political clique or faction. Okay. How weird. Okay, for one thing, homework is never done by any of the Pringles or half Pringles, and there is no use in appealing to the parents. They are suave, polite, evasive. I know all the pupils who are not Pringles like me, but the Pringle virus of disobedience is undermining the morale of the whole room. One morning, I found my desk turned inside out and upside down. Nobody knew who did it, of course, and no one could or would tell who left on it another day the box out of which popped an artificial snake when I opened it. But every Pringle in the school screamed with laughter over my face. I suppose I did look wildly startled. Jen Pringle comes late for school half the time, always with some perfectly watertight excuse, delivered politely with an insolent tilt to her mouth. She passes notes in class under my very nose. I found a peeled onion in the pocket of my coat when I put it on today. I should love to lock that girl up on bread and water until she learned how to behave herself. The worst thing to date was the caricature of myself I found on the blackboard one morning, done in white chalk with scarlet hair. Everybody denied doing it, Jen amongst the rest, but I knew Jen was the only people in the room who could draw like that. It was done well. I knows, which you know has always been my one pride and joy, was humpback. And my mouth was the mouth of a vinegary spinster who had been teaching school, a school full of Pringles for 30 years. But it was me. I woke up at 3 o'clock that night and writhed over the recollection. Isn't it queer the things we writhe over at night are seldom wicked things, just humiliating ones. 
All sorts of things are being said. I'm accused of marking down Hattie Pringle's examination papers just because she is a Pringle. I'm said to laugh when the children make mistakes. Well, I did laugh when Fred P Pringle defined a centurion as a man who had lived a hundred years. I couldn't help it. James Pringle is saying there is no discipline in the school, no discipline whatsoever, and a report is being circulated that I am a foundling. I'm beginning to encounter the Pringle antagonism in other quarters, socially as well as educationally. Summerside seems to be under the Pringle thumb. And you know what? We're 25 minutes. I think I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> so, part one of chapter two. Hope you all have a lovely and blessed Sunday. And I will be live today. Yay! Another tea with me at three Eastern, of course. So, hope to see you then. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Love y'all.